All right, so we've been doing these uh, Tillos videos lately, which I feel like is a good way to kind of introduce uh, the people behind Tillos um, and, you know, move beyond kind of gimmicking marketing and really just be authentic and talk about things and kind of like connect with the community. So today is uh, kind of super excellent because obviously, Justin, you're the Tellos OG. You've been here the longest. Um, you pretty much know everything that's happened. And so I was thinking today we can just kind of like, you know, shoot the breeze, have a casual conversation, talk about the history of Telos, maybe kind of like a chronological discussion, and then we can dive into some some things that might be interesting for the community to learn about. Um, so, yeah, I mean, maybe just tell us a bit about yourself and kind of how you got involved in, you know, the early days of Telos, let's say. Man, we're going back a back a while. It's uh, yeah, it's been quite some time. Um, so I got involved in Telos, uh, well, obviously at the beginning, which was back in December 2018. I'd sort of uh, been working in technology before that. Um, I'd recently come to the US. Um, was just sort of taking a little bit of a break from 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 working um, and looking for like you know my my next adventure. I'd been getting into, you know, sort of Bitcoin and a few things uh, before that, just like sort of dabbling. Uh, it, it seemed kind of interesting, but um, I saw like some issues um, that that I thought like things like Ethereum uh, were, were kind of building from and, and improving on. Um, you know, obviously Bitcoin is amazing technology for, you know, a store of value um, and that, that has tremendous value, but, you know, there wasn't um, a lot of interesting things that you could really do with it. You couldn't build uh, like whole ecosystems, uh, economically incentivize ecosystems. And, and so I really wanted to get into that. And at the time, obviously, Ethereum had come along, which was amazing, but it was incredibly slow. And, and so I was kind of looking for projects that, uh, you know, or, or people to, to join up with, um, to build something that was a little bit more, uh, you know, faster, you know, usable to the public, you know, could handle thousands of transactions per second. And, and so I, I kind of stumbled upon the, the EOS stack, uh, what, what, you know, block one had been doing at the time. And, um, you know, it seemed kind of impressive, but the, the governance side of things was, was kind of awful. Um, and, and so a group of us, sort of came out of that EOS launch a little bit unhappy with where that governance was going and we wanted to build something uh, with that same performance attributes um, that you could build, you know, dApps that could potentially serve millions of people. Um, and so we we sort of dove into to Telos, started that, a group of over 100 of us actually, and we were kind of looking at all the ways that we could improve it, including, you know, starting with the governance uh, making sure you could have uh, free accounts for everyone because that was a big issue of EOS at the time. Um, and so we we spent about six months building this out. Um, yeah, over over 100 people, all the different aspects of it, the business development, the, the, the system contracts, developing those, um, all the government governance rules. Um, and yeah, it was quite, it was, it was pretty interesting. <laughs> And uh, a lot of work. Um, and then we launched this thing, uh, Telos. And, um, you know, it was, it was kind of interesting. It was a little bit of a flat launch in a lot of ways. Um, you know, everyone was really excited, but um, we learned a lot of things really, really quickly. Um, we learned that exchanges will not just list your project because it's a really great project. Uh, and then we started pivoting to, or not pivoting, but we, we just put our heads down and we started to... Um, I guess aggressively onboard a lot of applications and we managed to do that with like basically no money the the foundation was given um i think five or six million tokens at the time but because we launched without any liquidity um and any fundraising the tokens were basically worthless uh, but nonetheless we managed to um really convince a uh, you know at least tens of applications eventually a hundred applications uh to to build 
what is basically proof of concepts, let's, let's be honest. They're not all great applications. And this was on our native layer at the time. Um, and, and so that was an interesting time. And the more that we poured in our energy, we'd, we'd onboard more apps, but then exchanges still wouldn't list us, which made it hard for us to be visible and made it hard for people to engage with the community or, or become part of this community rather. Um, so <laughs> over the years, we've learned a tremendous amount of lessons. Uh, we eventually did some small community raises uh, that allowed us to open up a bridge to Ethereum and Binance Smart Chain and and um, get some liquidity via PancakeSwap and Uniswap. And those were huge events for us because they we were previously on like one or two no-name exchanges and no one could get access. Um, and then also at that around that same time, this was around 2018, uh, sorry, not 2018, uh, 2021, I want to say. Uh, late 2021, we started building, oh no, about four or five months before that, we started building uh, the TELUS EVM. We realized that there were tremendous sort of issues with our native layer or what we call TELUS Zero in there. It wasn't very um, user-friendly uh, for, for users in particular, uh, but also a lot of uh, the developer stack that is available on Ethereum wasn't wasn't there, and there was also um, tremendous issues I think with scalability on Ethereum and other Ethereum-based platforms. In fact, there wasn't particularly many of those at the time. Um, so we saw this opportunity to build an entire EVM on top of the Telos Zero stack, um, and and so we we went and did that, and that was a lot of work. Uh, we ended up getting it audited um, by a group called Sentinel. They're actually one of our block producers. And um, that actually was what put us on the map. I think this is how you discover, discovered us, John, is um, when we were getting our EVM audited, uh, they do this thing called differential fuzzing. And that's uh, basically they're comparing um, running you know, code on the original Ethereum EVM, called, um, which uses Go Ethereum, and they compare that with running the code on our Telus EVM. And they came up with some differences that they weren't expecting. And then they looked into those differences and they realized that there was an issue with the original Go Ethereum client. It was actually like a very high priority security issue. Um, so this like resulted in a lot of coin telegraph articles and other things and really put Telos out there. Um, not just because we were building a, you know, high performance EVM, but because it had uncovered a major, uh, security flaw that meant like about six or seven different networks had to do, um, upgrades. And, uh, yeah, the way it was handled was very interesting because it was very secretive before it was publicized, um. Because like if, you know, the wrong hands or the wrong uh, people found out about this vulnerability, there would have been um, potentially a major hack on some of these uh, significant ecosystems with, you know, billions of dollars uh, in money at stake. So anyway, eventually we uh, launched our EVM and uh, yeah, it's been two years, I guess, since then. And it's... it's um, yeah, there's been a lot of work, a lot of applications onboarded, uh, you know, some struggles with getting compatibility to be 100%. Um, but I think we're starting to get there. We're starting to get in a really good place at, a right, at the right time, I'd say. Um, but there's still a lot of work to, to be done. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's quite an intro and a lot to unpack there, I'd, I'd say kind of the two spiciest takes I'd like to delve into is, uh, first of all, it, the two things that stick out is obviously the launch, the, let's say disillusionment with block one. Um, that's a well-publicized kind of, um, you know, social, economic, political drama bomb. Um, and then, and then I think also just the extent to which the Ethereum community does not actually realize that Telos, to some extent, may have saved Ethereum at one point. Um, so, uh, you know, but going back to the early days, I remember 
when the EOS ICO launched. I mean, I was deep into Ethereum at the time. I was working for consensus and I was very kind of adversarial to EOS, thinking like many Ethereum people at the time, this was a type of existential thread. And uh, anyway, I gave them full credit insofar as they ran an ICO for a year and got people to give them $4 billion for free, basically. Um, whether that's, you know, whatever, you can have your own judgment about that. But um, yeah, I was very surprised that the, let's say the, the lack of investment from Block One, I mean, they did invest in very large real estate projects and U.S. treasuries, but in terms of funding the ecosystem, um, maybe you can talk a little bit about that as far as some of the struggles around the original EOS community, uh, around basically developing and deploying the technology um, and, you know, how that essentially um, may or may not have motivated uh, the genesis of Telos, essentially. Yeah, I mean, we we didn't totally expect, um, or we, we had some inklings that, you know, they would maybe not deploy as much capital as we were expecting or hoping for, rather. Um, but But frankly, like, we were kind of shocked at how little, uh, like, support actually was deployed to to the general EOSIO community at the time. Um, you know, you look at um, networks like Solana and the amount of support that the Solana Foundation, you know, put into their, uh, like, native layer has been tremendous in terms of, like, wallets and indexes and, you know, really key important apps for DeFi, NFTs, NFT marketplaces, etc., And you've seen what is possible if you put in a lot of money or, well, you look at it and, and Solana, you know, raised nowhere near the $4 billion that uh, Block One raised. Um, and, and yeah, we were never really bitter about it at, at Telos. We just, we're just technologists. We wanted to um, build with this really cool technology um, but, but what ended up happening was, you know, block one had their hands tied by the SEC and they weren't able to deploy any capital really. Um, and therefore the, the ecosystem really suffered. I mean, it would have been really great for Telos because anything that, uh, any money that was put into EOS had a after effect to Telos. A lot of those projects end up deploying on Telos as well or, or migrating to Telos. But it was never an expectation from us. And so we weren't as bitter as the EOS community was about all this stuff. And in a lot of ways, that lack of bitterness allowed us to focus on what we need to do next. And it allowed us to move quickly, think about other things, think about building an EVM whilst they were just sort of griping about what Block One wasn't was or wasn't doing um and we were just like a lot quicker to pick up that you know money wasn't going to come in and we had to get creative yeah yeah i think that's a really good point i mean even with early ethereum days I, i'm not saying that something similar happened with the ethereum foundation but there were very large unexpected catastrophic events people had to navigate of course the dow was a big one etc and really at the end of the day it was the technologist and the devs picking up pieces and just moving forward regardless of whatever. Um, so I guess just to expand a little bit more on that point you just said, as far as just moving on with it and carrying on, I guess, can you talk a little bit about uh, the actual distribution of Telos and again, the fact that there wasn't some big token sale or ICO or pre mine or anything that created a initial big bang liquidity event um in fact it's quite the opposite it's like you grind oh, totally away over a very long a long period of time with no money um distributing basically as fairly or as closely to bitcoin as possible really for any evm um which i think at this point now looking back on it is kind of a tremendous advantage for telos because it likely doesn't have the regulatory overhang of a token sale um and it's one of those things you can't replicate except for with time and just grinding through many difficult years of basically having no money no 100 percent. it was 
probably as opposite to doing an ICO as possible because um, we actually gave away tokens based on the the EOS snapshot. Um, we wanted to, you know, since those people were helping to fund the the code development that Block One did do, they did, to be fair to them, you know, iterate on several versions of the code and it was reasonable. But, you know, obviously that was a fraction of what they raised. Um, so we did do an airdrop for the majority of tokens, uh, basically to the EOS holders. And that actually created a real struggle for us because, you know, we were airdropping to people that didn't necessarily care about Telos. They just got these free tokens and they're like, oh, these have some value and I'm just going to sell them. Um, so for years, that really created an opportunity for a lot of people who do care about the technology uh, to purchase tokens relatively cheap and be a part of this story. And like, I mean, even to this day, uh, we're a pretty low value network, I would say. And it almost feels like anyone coming in at this point is a founder because you're, you're able to get in at such a, a low point um, and really be a part of this kind of growth story. Um, so yeah, it's, it was an interesting way to do things. Um, and it wasn't until later that, you know, via our governance mechanism that allows us to uh, perform these things called amendments, um, that the community in fact decided that we should do some sort of, uh, tokenized sale. And we did, uh, what we called the, the T-bond sale, um, which we were selling these, uh, these basically NFT bonds, they were like um, an NFT that wrapped a bunch of Telos and it came in different packages of like, you know, 20,000 Telos, 50,000 Telos, 100,000 Telos. And they also had different uh, lengths of, um, what do you call it? Lockup periods, like three months, six months, 12 months, 24 months. And uh, so the community decided we wanted to do this sort of sale and it allowed us to raise some funding for our first exchange, which I believe was KuCoin, or our first significant exchange. Um, and also uh, potentially, I think, helped to, to pay for the EVM partly. Um, so it was really like a groundswell moment, I guess, where we decided, hey, we've already delivered a ton of technology, uh, but let's... Uh, you know, do a little community raise and and allow ourselves to become more visible and accessible to the world, essentially. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I feel like Telos has just been grinding away, you know, working through lots and lots of challenges, which kind of has led to what I think is pretty spectacular innovation. Um, and as you said, that process led you to the EVM pretty quickly. Um, and I, I, I think it would be helpful and enlightening for many Ethereum people who might be watching this video, if you can just delve in a little bit more as far as what that code audit discovered uh, with respect to, you know, out auditing the Telos EVM and discovering that there was a critical flaw in Ethereum itself uh, and just the whole story of how all that kind of unfolded, I'm sure it must've been very chaotic at the time. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, you know, it's been a while now, so I don't actually remember the exact details of the audit itself, but I remember, um, you know, when Sentinel discovered it, they actually initially couldn't tell us directly exactly what the issue was. Uh, because they wanted to speak to uh, the Go Ethereum team first, let them know, you know, they didn't want to take any chances that, you know, the the vulnerability would get out to the wrong people. Um, so it was actually handled very delicately um, where they said they found something, but that that's all they said. Um, and then they went to the Go Ethereum team, allowed the Go Ethereum team, I think, like, you know, they had some weeks or however long it, it took to, to fix the vulnerability. And then even the, the Go Ethereum team had to push that out covertly to all the different networks, Binance Smart Chain, uh, I think maybe Avalanche and, and some others as well. Um, 
and they all had to update before this actually even went to the media. And, you know, we pretty much uh, found out, I think around the same time as the, the media found out. Um, so yeah, it ha had to be handled really delicately. Unfortunately, I'm, it's been like uh, almost two years now, so I don't remember the exact details and I'm not the most technical person anyway. Yeah, maybe we can do uh, uh, a post-mortem summary uh, and, you know, put out some content kind of like oh, in, support of this, in support of this podcast. Um, just kind of like the history of Telos because I think that's a very unique moment that basically the mainstream of the community and either memory hold or never really knew much about at the time. Um, oh, definitely. Yeah. So I guess moving forward then, you know, it's kind of like the EVM launches um, and you guys start moving in this uh, new direction. Um, I guess back then leadership was a little bit different and um, there's obviously been some changes there. So maybe you can talk about um, kind of like the post EVM era, you know, after you've launched the EVM and, you know, sort of leading up to perhaps last December um, and some of the changes uh, we've seen uh, during that time, you know, as, as TELUS is really focused on the EVM uh, market. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, the it's actually quite challenging even once you launch an EVM uh, because there's still like certain little bugs and issues and compatibilities. Um, so, you know, we, we launched the EVM and we, we started to onboard, um, you know, a few different applications. Um, it, it took some time to get, say, um, the first decks, I think like maybe like a month, month and a half, uh, just because of these technical issues that, that pop up. Um, and then every app sort of has dependencies, whether it's um, a graph node or some indexer or or it just could be so many different things. Uh, some, you know, Ethereum standard or contract that isn't deployed yet. So the, there were a lot of different little pieces that we had to deploy onto the EVM or get others to deploy. And, and so it took a little bit of time uh, to ramp up and I've noticed this happen with other EVMs um, more recently. It t typically it takes like almost a year after an EVM is launched, for like things to really, really start ramping up and you get like these, these network effects that come together. Um, I guess you call it composability um, where, you know, some lending protocol is able to launch because a DeFi platform is launched and there's enough liquidity on there and then, something else is able to launch like a stable coin. And so there's this like level of composability that like builds up over time and it doesn't always just happen overnight. Um, so the, the EVM is really at a point where there's like a couple of different options of every single type of app or at least one or two. Um, so it's, in a it's in a really good place. Um, in terms of like the, the changes to the team or the overall, you know, how we're running things. Yeah, we have, we have had some changes over the years. Um, one of the th big things that has changed, I think like in the last four months is um, initially the, the TCD and the TF were like completely separate, you, but we can you, collaborate. Can, can, you, can you just uh, elaborate on those acronyms in case people don't know? Oh yeah, of course. Uh, so I think I said the T TCD, Tells Core Developers. And then we've got the TELS Foundation, which we sometimes refer to as the, the TF. Um, and so in the last three, four months, uh, we've started to sort of merge these two uh, entities together. Um, although like we did collaborate, you know, quite extensively together in the past, um, it's it became really important, I think, um, especially with the amount of business development the, the foundation does, the amount of feedback loop that we get from all the different applications in the ecosystem. We're like super hyper aware of, um, I guess, like what are the pain points uh, for the network. And um, so by having these separate entities sort of doing their own thing and no sort of overarching accountability structure, we found that... Um, 
sort of you you can have different focus areas for these different organizations um so yeah w- one of the big things is that that merging of those two entities into into one entity um and i think it's resulted in um a lot more productivity and and focus on the things that the community is asking for the most especially the the development community so that's that's been like a, a major I, I guess change in the last few months that um I think is leading to uh, probably a higher pace of development on on the EVM, especially. Pretty. Yeah, I think. I mean, I've recently come in, and I, I would say that's exactly right what you just described. <laughs> and what's really important about that is um, the extent to which, for example, the biz dev team who interacts with all the apps which we're onboarding and gets direct feedback about their pain points, wherein our goal is to ensure as little overhead as possible for deploying so that developer resources are not constrained, you know, with our partners. Um, That is critical feedback, which we then can in a more direct way relate to TCD and their focus on. And so that kind of segues to, I guess, the next couple questions here, just talking about um, technical infrastructure, maybe some of the technical debt we've accrued, some of the steps we're taking to improve. Um, on the one hand, uh, you can you can say that the way the EVM runs on top of Layer Zero Telos is a very interesting research and development effort. Uh, there are performance characteristics that are kind of crazy. Um, the network has not fallen over like other networks, um, but at the same time, there are issues that come up: RPC issues, subgraphs might fall over, etc. That's kind of like an indexing problem. Um, and those nuisance issues are fires that we have to basically put out from time to time. Um, while at the same time, the EVM ecosystem is certainly developing tremendously. We recently, for example, on the indexing side, onboarded uh, subquery as an example. We've had conversations with Superchain. Um, and you can imagine basically... Um, key partnerships as those solutions develop, integrating into Telos and resolving a lot of this type of technical debt across a wide spectrum of uh, critical infrastructure or even less critical infrastructure. And so maybe if you can just kind of expand on that a little bit more um, and, and give a sense of some of the challenges, what's actually happening now and what people can expect going forward. <laughs> Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, um, it, it's quite difficult to build, you know, an Ethereum virtual machine essentially from scratch. And and one of the benefits of that was actually that because it is a unique implementation, uh, it resulted in that, um, you know, finding out that bug with Ethereum and other ecosystem EVMs, and and also the performance advantages that you you covered, John. Um, but yeah, there, there is like a certain level of technical debt that comes with building your own EVM. And it's uh, it's definitely taken a while to get on top of that. Um, it definitely has some costs to, you know, the the community or, or rather the, the, the dApps that are, you know, building on top of Telos. You know, it comes with its pros and its cons. And, um, you know, we're really starting to, work to not only get on top of those issues um, through eventually the the 1.5 release, uh, which admittedly, I think that the TCD would say that in hindsight, they should have jumped straight to the 2.0 release, which is a more ideal solution. Although there are some like um, some dependencies that both 1.5 and 2.0 have. So that wasn't a total... Uh, waste uh it's just you know one of those things that you realize um you know after the fact maybe you should have gone a different way uh, there's no way to perfectly predict the future um but yeah definitely in hindsight uh if they'd known there were going to be certain issues that come up then they would might have taken a different path um but yeah i think some of the solutions uh going forward uh you know bringing on more partners that can help deploy different things such as, you know, indexes and um, even help us build out the future versions of the the EVM um, and just get really dialed in 
uh, with you know the best devs um, and and really learn from our lessons in the past um, to essentially um, deliver a world class EVM and RPC uh, system. Um, it's, it's just one of those things that you realize if we want to be um, the best or if we want to be really up there with the top you know 50 projects in this space, then we can't just be okay or even just good. We sort of need to be, I'd say even like an order of magnitude better. Like we've obviously got um, some really amazing speed and performance char characteristics with our EVM and RPC, but having reliability and stability as well is part of the package if you want to be up there with you know Polygon and Phantom and some others. And I think we've fallen a little bit short on those things. And um, we really need to be up there or better. And the reality is we need to do that with a smaller team than these others. Um, but but that's just the way it is. And you know, it's it's definitely possible. Sometimes a smaller team means more focus, more execution. And we need to make the most of that and and deliver something that is really top notch. Um, because I think uh, word of mouth in the developer community is one of the best ways uh, to grow. And um, yeah, it's it's not necessarily all hype. It's it's actually just executing at a really high level. And uh, developers will talk if you deliver a really great product. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. And uh... You know, I would frame it as, just to kind of summarize how I understand it, you get these performance characteristics that are pretty spectacular, but at the cost of high maintenance and overhead. And the reason for that is because, you know, compatibility becomes... I mean, the further you abstract away from type 1, the more performance you can achieve, for sure, but you sort of have a harder time keeping up with EIPs, um, just the general development state of the EVN. And um, so that becomes basically a maintenance issue. Um, the way to resolve that is obviously resources is one way to do it. Partnerships with key, um, let's say, infrastructure uh, or tooling providers. Um, and of course, developing solutions in-house, as you said, uh, 1.5 or actually even 2.0 uh, which the TCD is working on. Um, so, yeah, and, and I agree. I think the better the experience for developers, um, it has a what Charlie Munger refers to as a Lollapalooza effect, which is like when multiple things work in your favor, you get exponential, you know, spectacular growth opportunities. Um, and so I definitely think developer satisfaction, if you will, is one of the key attributes of any successful network so i did see your tweet from february 17th you said uh, hey telos fam recording inside telos episode anything interesting you want us to cover so i'm just gonna ask you a couple of questions the community um tweeted about if that's all right yeah uh, we can kind of tackle some of those so call it here uh, call it zero two whatever he's got like a long ass username um, <laughs> security is a paramount concern for blockchain platforms what measures does telos take to ensure the security integrity of its network are there any recent security enhancements or audits yeah actually that's a that's a really great question especially uh coming after i think it was uh late last week uh we had the issue with uh twitter um Apparently, I think someone internally accidentally approved uh, a fake app uh, with the Twitter account and temporarily, uh, fortunately, uh, you know, a, a group was able to post uh, using our Twitter. Uh, thankfully, we were able to get on top of that really, really quickly. Uh, I think, you know, within a half an hour or so and... Uh, remove that permission but it did open up uh or, or just reminded us of the importance of security you know on a number of levels um we're actually going through a, a security audit for our socials right now um but i would say generally um with security especially blockchain security uh we need to 
you know, we, we've always done auditing, uh, which is really important. But I think, um, you know, looking at some of the protocols that we're working with, like layer zero, they will take or do two or three audits on just one piece of code, um, which I think is is really setting a very, very high standard that I think we should start to move towards getting, you know, more than one auditor uh, for, you know, a component of our system, whether it be the EVM contract, the RPC, uh, Tell Zero, um, or, or a- any other component of the, of the network. Um, our LSD contract is another one. Uh, so, yeah, I think the, there's a really high bar that is being set by some of the uh, top names in this industry, and I think we need to start to move towards that. Uh, but as it stands, we we obviously take security very seriously and we get everything audited. Um, but I think we eventually, or, or sooner rather than later, want to go to that next level. And um, just little things, um, you know, like the recent Twitter incident are good reminders of that because, you know, it can be quite costly to the community if, um, you know, something gets hacked or even our, our socials get hacked. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, thankfully, it only lasted, I think, just a few minutes or whatever, but, um, you know, and it did happen to the SEC. And it is a clear reminder that actually the attack vectors are not just in the core tech, but on the peripherals too. Um, okay, so here we have uh, KCR. It says, uh, insights on airdrop strategy for the upcoming side chains of Telos would be great. Um yeah, we're holding Telos be like having uh, Celestia Adam inject as in terms of eligibility. Um, so I guess first talk a little bit about kind of the network of networks narrative and exactly what he means by the sidechain uh, uh, thing and then how that kind of folds into potentially our airdrop strategy going forward. Yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, yeah, we've evolved now to become uh, a network of networks or uh, an L0 as it's sometimes referred to. Actually, we started on this path when we added the EVM uh, on top of uh, Telos Native, uh, which is now called Telos Zero. And that narrative has sort of continued and more solidified uh, since we you know, decided to uh, delve into ZK EVM technology and roll-ups. Um, we've seen that you know, sometimes the governance or the scalability isn't there on, you know, a layer one. In our case, it's not really a scalability issue, but more of a, a governance and community aspect. Um, so one of the, the ZK EVMs we've identified first up is a gaming ZK EVM uh, called K218, uh, which is uh, currently in development. Um, the underlying software, the ZK EVM is is uh, currently being developed and, and going through various stages of testing. Um, and, and we see a really great opportunity to bring in uh, a really a gaming focused community and have gaming focused grants and basically an ecosystem run by gamers, uh, which is something that, um, you know, it tell us like we dabble in gaming, but we're not necessarily experts in gaming. So, we're sort of developing this whole team that is just gaming only, gaming focus. Um, and there's going to be more opportunities um, for these uh, L2s going forward. And even talking to some projects that could be like an L1 that that is built on top of um, Tell Zero. Um, and, you know, I, I don't want to like give any specifics, but, you know, we could uh, be doing things like a, a Bitcoin layer two at some stage. You know, it's only something we're exploring. Uh, there's, um, we're talking to some projects that um, are looking at uh, privacy specifically or, or data protection rather, and, and they want to deploy something that is focused purely on that. Um, and again, the that, that's a really great example of um, where they want to deploy a network or a platform rather that has properties that an open transparent uh, platform like Telos EVM doesn't uh, really deliver all the, those aspects. Um, so these are really great um, 
opportunities and they also open up um, airdrop opportunities, obviously. Uh, we're not really ready to go into the details of how the airdrops will work. In a lot of cases, we're still figuring that out. We want to, you know, obviously take uh, the best of what uh, communities like Celestia are doing, take the inspiration from there, find out what worked, what didn't work, and adjust based on that. Um, but you definitely will hear more about this. And I hope I've given like at least some context of how we're thinking about this and how we're thinking about the Telos ecosystem as not just Telos Zero and Telos EVM, but um, something that you can build other networks on top of. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So I guess maybe one or two. This is from The Dude. He says, not very technical, but can we please give some attention to the way Telos is being presented across different DeFi's and wallets? For example, MetaMask only shows a T. For Telos EVM, SafePal, I mean, P tokens are still showing the old logo and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it's kind of like that's out of our control. We're talking to everybody. We're trying to rally the community to upgrade. Um, but yeah, maybe you can talk about like the challenges of... Uh, getting others to be responsive and uh you know some of the approaches we're taking you know just to even update our logo for example on you know uh a wallet or trading view or something like that yeah decentralization is really hard <laughs> and these ecosystems that we're building here like have so many uh you know we're relying on so many different partners um if we want to make a change and definitely changing our logo is a really simple example of that, where it does take uh, months to get everyone across the line. Um, so MetaMask is, uh, you know, a difficult one. We obviously want to get uh, direct integration with them and all of our logos and our network added by default. I think that's going to take some time. But um, I know, you, John, you've worked with, uh, you know, that team in the past, so maybe that gives us a chance there. Um, but actually, uh, yeah, we, we're pushing on these. Uh, the other example uh, dude gave, uh, we've act actually fixed. I forgot what that was. Um, P tokens, actually, yeah. That that bridge logo is now is now fixed. So we're getting there, and we're, we're close to the end of that. I, yeah, I noticed um, yesterday, I think it was not trading view, which is one that we need to update, but um, I think DeFi Llama. It still has the old logo, so yeah, there's there's so many of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so one last, and this one is spicy, and uh, you know, you can be as uh, considerate as you like for how you want to answer this, but uh, from Estefan TT, he says, "How Telos plans to position itself as a Bitcoin layer two? These are going up to." Uh, B, I guess that means Bitcoin too high for small and medium transactions. Um, and in this very cycle and further a crisis is coming, Telos could have a play to next to Lightning Liquid and thus have an infinite amount of capital flowing into its ecosystem. Maybe not infinite, but you know, that's that's kind I'm of sure what Estefan is saying. Yeah. No, I think that's a really fantastic question. And I think it starts with um, finding uh, the real ideal partner to put Bitcoin on Telos. Obviously, we've got um, a version of Bitcoin on our EVM already, uh, but it is a wrapped version, and we would like something a little bit more substantial. Um, so ideally, something that, you know, is backed by, you know, Coinbase and their um, custodial services um, and has, like, a lot of interoperability with um, our Layer 2s and future layer ones um so really the the trick is finding the the right partnerships and that's something that we're working really hard on along with actually finding you know the ideal stable coin partner as well uh because it does take time to get like a direct uh you know usdc deployment uh but there are some new um partners that you know have come up more recently and we're we're talking to them and we're definitely looking for sort of a Bitcoin partner that could could bring a really high quality version of um, Bitcoin on-chain for Telos. And um, 
Yeah, because I think like security is something really important. You know, people bring a tremendous amount of money on chain, especially their Bitcoin. And um, the current solutions are kind of very custodial and maybe that's just the way it is, but maybe there's some technologies that, you know, take, take away uh, some of the security risks or attack vectors. And uh, we're definitely looking into it. Yeah. Cool. Um, I guess just a couple more quick, quick questions for me to touch upon um, first. Um, obviously, there's been some price movement lately. And uh, last year, there was um, governance passed, which describes um, tokenomics going forward, the impact on the Telos Foundation, and likewise, um, price relative to USD and its impact on Telos inflation, rather uh, deflation. And so maybe if you can just kind of briefly talk a bit about that, we can, of course, share links. And I mean, the governance is all very transparent and clear has been for some time, but I think a just kind of quick summary and overview uh, would be very helpful for a lot of people who maybe haven't read the governance yet. Yeah, so, um, you know, in some of our past economic proposals, uh, we've brought into play, you know, some different economic mechanisms. Um, one of these is that we have variable uh, block producer pay. Uh, so as the price of uh, telos adjusts upwards uh, the amount of telos that goes to block producers actually goes down uh, because you know their their costs are typically in usd uh, so this has a really nice um, economic effect where you know less there's less inflation essentially every single uh well as as price moves upwards uh, so it makes the the network actually more sustainable over time uh, which is something that we really want for a flourishing economic system like Telos is. Um, there's also a number of other things that have gone into fruition uh, more recently. Uh, one of those is um, burns of uh, EVM fees. Uh, so every single month, uh, fees accrue uh, in one of the EVM accounts on Telos, well, in the, the EVM account on Telos Zero. Uh, that they accrue from all the activity that's happening on chain, which you know is ramping up at the moment. And um, at the end of the month, the uh, uh, burn is basically performed, and that helps to create a, sort of a deflationary effect. Um, and and I think there'll be future proposals that will also kind of help to bring different uh, inflationary effects down, and even add on more deflationary burn mechanisms. Uh, so I think our goal as a community, and I can't speak for everyone, but I've, in my role, I speak to a lot of different people and everyone seems to be in, you know, very high alignment that over time we want to obviously produce more fees from the activity on chain. Uh, there, there's also very much an alignment that uh, we want to um, reduce the, the inflationary effects and, and, and increase the deflationary effects as well. So, um, yeah, if we achieve what we want to achieve by pushing all the needles forward, uh, over time, I think uh, Telos will become one of the most, or if not the most sustainable network in the world. Um, and that that's one of our goals. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, and like I said, we'll post some links uh, to the governance proposals, the tokenomics, et cetera. But um, I think as it needs to have a lot more visibility so people can actually see. Um, and we're actually not far from kind of the first deflationary cliff, which I think is right around 50 cents in USD terms. Um, uh, yeah. And then I guess one last question, just um, obviously there's at least a perception. And I would say from working from the inside, at Telos, um, clearly, uh, it's real that there is a tremendous amount of activity, which is sort of increased of late, um, particularly as it relates to um, inbound. So various groups reaching out to us, whether they're applications, DApps, uh, infrastructure providers, market makers—I mean, just all sorts of range of actors—are. Um, pipeline our business development pipeline we had a video 
a couple weeks ago, Mickey, she talked a little bit about that is very robust and kind of like full. I mean, we're, we have more inbound than we have basically capacity to process right now, although we're doing our best to get through it. Um, so I just wonder if you can contextualize the current state of, um, all of that activity relative to sort of in the past, um, just so people can get a sense of, you know, what's happening today versus maybe how things went in the past, uh, you know, from the standpoint of inbound activity and, and, and partnership and other types of opportunities, uh, you know, therein. Yeah, that's a really, really great, um, question. Um, so yeah, I think that there's been a tremendous ramp up definitely um i think there's a lot of things coalescing together that that are resulting in this this faster pace i think one of those is um you know when we brought on uh nikki into the team she brought a tremendous amount of connections and um she's just a a baller hey what she does uh, she's a real dj and um you know she she's put together a huge uh number of apps that have come on board and i think those are also bringing on you know partner apps and and there's a certain level of composability that is really creating uh, or, or making telos a bit of a magnet for for dApps at the moment and then on top of that um you know we've got um you know people like yourself john coming into the team bringing you know some really great relationships and really ramping up bd as well um lee you know, our, our new uh, CEO has also brought in a number of connections. Um, the introduction of Justin Edwards, our head of gaming, and what he's doing. Uh, we've just like really upped our game over the last year in terms of um, the quality of um, the contributors within the team. And yeah, and also the network effects on top of that of the different DAP partners that we've brought on. Um, are just creating this like atomic effect um, and and with that also the you know it being a bull market there's a lot of excitement there's a lot of new apps as well uh, coming in to web3 generally um, but yeah just generally all of these things together are resulting in um, a huge uptick in in apps coming on board yeah yeah and also resulting in many many more work hours i feel like we are all pretty much working all the time now like um <laughs> you know like i but you know that's fine i mean that's the way it goes and uh you know uh when there is progress and you start to see growth uh it's certainly certainly exciting to get to work every morning um even if it's like seven days a week uh but um I think we're all pretty excited about that. Um, cool. So uh, yeah, let's keep uh, let's keep kind of these things rolling. Probably do some more videos in the coming months like this. Uh, I feel like people really appreciate this, <laughs> this format um, just because it's like authentic. It's real. It's straight answers. Um, no, no hype. No spin. Just like you know, honestly talking about what's going on. Um, but uh, yeah, so we got the Asia Road Tour in swing right now, or the Asia Pivot, really. Um, I'm in Tokyo now, so we're going to get a few more stops, and then I guess hopefully we can all hang out in person, uh, maybe in Europe in the, in the very near future, like after Asia. Obviously, we're going to F Belgrade and FCC, et cetera. So yeah, let's just keep talking. Uh, maybe do another one of these in a month or two. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, everybody can find us on Twitter. We'll be there pretty much every day so uh yeah thanks very much justin super super good uh great uh great great podcast today so thank you thank you it's been great